it is good to be in the house of the Lord. Amen? Amen. All right. Well, as the worship team is making their way up here, let's go before the Lord in prayer and ask him to uh, bless the service. So God, we are so grateful for who you are. We're so grateful that we can gather together here and sing praises unto you, Lord. God, I ask now that uh, as we get ready to worship you, you would just remove all of the distractions from us, God. Help us to worship you in spirit and in truth. And Lord, uh, we just love you and praise you for everything that you're doing in our lives and in and through this church. And it's in Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen and welcome. Welcome if you're tuned in online. It's a blessing to be here in the house of the Lord. Amen. Right on. These are my friends, Diana and Travis. They're up here. They're going to share a song with us later. And uh, God is good. So let's just worship the Lord this morning.
You freed every captive and break every chain, oh God. You have done great things. We dance in your freedom, awake and alive. Oh Jesus, our Savior, your name lifted high, oh God. You have done great things. Amen. All right. Feel free to take a seat if you'd like or remain standing. This song is a new song for this congregation. It's called Death Was Arrested. And as I shared with the first service, the chorus, it says, Oh, your grace so free washes over me. You have made me new. Now life begins with you. What a just proclamation of what God has done and does in our lives. His grace washes freely over us each and every day. What a blessing that is. We need God's grace. We need God's grace to walk worthy, the Bible says, of what he's called us to. You see, he delivered us from darkness. He brought us into the light. And now he's <laughs> discipling and training us up to serve and to, to take the gospel out and share what he's done for us with other people. And it takes the grace of God to do that. Amen? Amen. So as we sing this, just uh, join along with us as you kind of get familiar with the song. Your love made a way to 
Good morning. morning. Is it not a beautiful day out there? Uh, Trust me, it's going to get warm. The uh, stand up here and see all your smiling faces. You know, some of us here were privileged to reflect back on all the Fourth of Julys we've seen and and the celebrations that we witness, a celebration of the independence of our country. And those of us who have worn the country uniform in defense of it, not that we look differently at it, but I'm very proud of where I live. I am proud of my country. But there's a country I'm even more proud to be a citizen of, that country that is far better than the country that I reside in now. This is only a temporary place. Well, there's only two economies. There's time and there's eternity. Right now we're living in time. One day, those who have chosen Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior are gonna witness eternity. I'm looking for that. That's the country I wanna move to. Will you join with me in a prayer for the tithes and the offering? Father God, thank you so much that we can come here today and be at pleasure in your house, the house that's dedicated to you, and open our hearts. And may we witness to others by the love that we have for you and the love that we have for each other And sharing is a part of that. Stewardship is a part of that. God, you don't need what we have, the resources, but you gave them to us to exist, to utilize. And you give to us this opportunity to utilize a part of those gifts. And so, Lord, I ask that your hearts be open, that this indeed be a time of hilarity, a time of joy where we can share in your ministry. And so, Lord, I ask that you prosper those who open their hearts, who come before you now, who desire. There is a paradox, and that is the one who keeps will have less, but the one who shares will have much. So, Lord, my prayer is we all have much. And all of God's people said, Oh 
the altar, the Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Bear your cross as you wait for the crown till the world of the treasure you found. All right, if we have any children that would like to come on up, children, come one, come all, grab your instruments, grab two instruments, come on down, every child is more than welcome to come on up. Um, Jacob, I said children. It's okay. Come on. All right. We're getting the stage filled up, huh? Amen. All right. Okay. Everybody ready? All right. Here we go.
pray for our children before they run off. Father, we just bless these children. We know children are a gift from you, Lord. Help us to be those that raise them up in the, in the ways of you, Lord, and train them in, in the word of God and teach them to have a standard uh, with the word of God by which they follow all through their life. Yes. Lord, we just pray you would give us wisdom as we guide them. Lord, your precious children. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, if you take a moment and say hello to somebody. It is good to be in the house of the Lord, though, isn't it? Amen. Amen. With the family of God. And, you know, do we have any first-time guests here today? We do. Okay, well, we have a nice welcoming gift for you. One of the pastors or elders will come up and give you uh, one of those. And with that... Let's see what else we got for announcements. Today is communion, so at the end of service, we will be partaking in communion together. So just an opportunity to start preparing your hearts even now. And also for those of you who are watching online to get the elements together and, and uh, partake with us at the end of service. So as you know, we're going through the Truth Project on Monday nights. It's taking a two week hiatus because the 3rd, a lot of you are going to be gone. And then on the 10th or the 11th, it'll be right in the middle of VBS. So um, we're not, we're going to put a two week pause on it and then we'll continue on once again after that. Also, uh, for Wednesday, the potluck th theme is once again your favorite potluck dish because it was such a hit last Wednesday. It's good stuff, wasn't it? Yeah, I know, yeah. So we're gonna do that. Our upcoming movie here in the sanctuary on the 29th will be uh, Return to the Hiding Place. So if you've never seen it, come join us. Even if you have, come join us and just hang out and with fellowship. We have the July 4th outreach coming up. Uh, it'll begin at 5 p.m. The church will supply all the hot dogs. If you can, bring a side dish. If you can't, that's okay too, just show up. And then we also have, of course, uh, invitation cards. Take some of these, pass them out to your friends, family, people on the street. It really doesn't matter. And we'll have some great worship from Travis and Diana. We're excited about that. So they will be there also. And, um, you know, of course, we'll have the water slides and games and all the fun stuff uh, there also. So, And then we have uh, coming up... As I said earlier, from the 10th to the 14th, we will have VBS, our sign-up sheets, out in the foyer, both for the kids to, who want to come and also uh, for volunteers that would like to volunteer. So, And we could, speaking of volunteers, we could use some in the coffee shop and as greeters. So if you would like to get involved in that, you can talk with Pastor Aaron and he will get you all the information about it. And then lastly, um, we have a church family meeting just once again where all the pastors and elders will be available to answer any questions of the church or anything you would like to know on how the church is ran um, or scripture or whatever. So come join us for that. It'll be at 6 p.m. on Sunday, July 23rd. And then we also have the Pregnancy Care Center coming up, such a great ministry that you know we try to support uh, here, um, ministering to the ladies in our community that have found themselves pregnant. So we'll do the annual bottle drive during both services, first and second on the 16th. So uh, we're excited about that. And with that being said, let's go before the Lord as we continue on in worship. Oh, wait, no, I almost forgot. We have a U-turn gra graduation today. <laughs> Come on, Dave, let's get up here if some of the leaders from the church would come up so that we can pray over them. That would be awesome. All right, Lord, we come before you, and God, we are so grateful uh, just for the way that you work in our, work in our lives. And, and Lord, we lift up our brother Dave now to you as he enters into that next season of his walk with you, Lord. God, we just ask that you'd put your hedge of protection around him. Lord, that he would walk in the center of your will for his life. And Lord, we're so grateful that the good work that you've begun in him, you'll be faithful to complete it. And so, Lord, we lift him up to you now. God, we um, just pray for strength. And um, you know, like I said, that he would just walk 
in the middle of your perfect will for his life. And it is in Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Good job, buddy. So with that being said, let's worship. So we wanted to share this song with y'all. It's a song we wrote called We Belong. And, um, you know, we wrote it in a time in our lives where we just didn't feel connected with, with our church and just in, in general. And um, it, it was tough, you know, and, and we're thankful God gave us this song. And, you know, this is the first time we're sharing it with the church. And I think it's really good that we're sharing it here because we don't feel that way anymore. We, yeah, we... <laughs> We feel like we're, we're among family, and we're just so blessed to be here with everybody today.
Amen. Amen. We do belong in the house of the Lord. Isn't that glorious? Well, we are obviously going through 2 Corinthians, and this week we're going to be in chapter 4. So if you'd like to make your way in your Bibles to chapter 4, that's where we'll be. Um, while you're on your way, you know, I was thinking of a story as, as Pastor Frank was uh, talking about tithes and offerings and, you know, about how uh, we celebrate on July 4th the, the independence uh, of our country and our dependence on God. At least we as Christians, that's what we celebrate, right? And we're going to do that on the 4th, but it reminded me of a, of a story of this young boy who went to this church, and in the foyer, there was a list of uh, men and women who had died um, in the various wars over the years uh, that were members of the church. And so uh, the little boy asked the pastor, and he says, what are all these names? And the pastor said, well, these are members of the church that died in service. And so the little boy said, first or second service? Sorry, I couldn't resist. But on a serious note, last week we, we covered uh, chapter 3, verses 7 through 18. And in that, we spoke about a couple of different things, but we talked about the law versus the new covenant, right? And, and, and Paul was saying as it, part of this, they both had glory. The glory of the, of the law was that it brought death. And the glory of the new covenant was that it brought life. And he used some examples that we may recall. And he, point, he pointed out several things last week about the law and what the law can and cannot do, right? Because the law in and of itself, we know it can't justify the lost sinner, can it? You know, as, it, as he uh, said to the Galatians in chapter 2, verse 16, he says, Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Christ Jesus, that we might be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law. For the works of the law, or sorry, for by the works of the law, no flesh shall be justified. See, there's nothing in the law that can justify us, is there? There was nothing about the law. In fact, it was just to point us to the one who could justify us, and that's Jesus Christ. You know, and so he went on in, um, to the church of Galatia, giving several points of, you know, the deficiencies of the law in and of itself. First of all, it could never make us as sinners righteous, could it? In verse 21, he said, I do not set aside the grace of God. For if righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died in vain. Right? You know, if the law could save, then there was no point for Jesus' sacrifice on the cross. Right? If we could earn our salvation through the law, then he didn't need to die. But we know better, don't we? You know, that there is nothing that we could have done. We couldn't have obeyed the law enough to deserve or um, merit our salvation. You know, if so, that would have been based on our works, right? It would have been based on something that we've done instead of what Christ did for us on the cross. So he was pointing that out, and he was pointing out that the law cannot give life. It just can't. Galatians 3.21 says, Is the law then against the promises of God? Certainly not. For if there had been a law given which could have given life, truly righteousness would have been by the law. It just cannot give us life. It's only in the, the new covenant, as he talked about last week, that brings life, right? The law brought death. The new covenant brought life, spiritual life. You know, and, and the law cannot give us freedom. The law does not free us. In fact, it does just the opposite. It 
brings us into bondage. It brings us into the realization that we can't do enough. And so we have that pressure of uh, the weight of, of our sin and the law upon us, knowing that there was nothing that we can do to free ourselves from it. We were in bondage and captivity to our sin, right? We talked about that last week, and there, we had no way of getting rid of that. We were bearing the, the brunt and the weight of the world on our shoulders. And Galatians 4, 8 through 10 says, But then indeed, when you did not know God, you served those which by nature are not gods. But now, after you have known God, or rather you are known by God, how is it that you turn again to the weak and the beggarly elements to which you desire again to be in bondage? You observe days and months and seasons and years. I am afraid for you, lest I have labored for you in vain. He is saying all of your um, actions, all of your trying to be obedient to the law and observing all of the 600 odd rules in the Old Testament, it cannot bring you to that point. It can't free you from your bondage. There's only one that can free us from our bondage. Once again, it's Jesus Christ, isn't it? But we have the new covenant, the glorious covenant, you know, the covenant that brings righteousness instead of condemnation, right? And so last week, Paul talked about that in chapter 3, verses 9 and 10. It says, For if the ministry of condemnation had glory, the ministry of righteousness exceeds much more in glory. For even what was made glorious had no glory in this respect because of the glory that excels, right? You know, it's only in the glory or in the ministry of the New Testament, or of the New Covenant, that we can have righteousness. Because it's the righteousness that comes through our relationship with Jesus Christ, right? But the relation, or when we were trying to or be obedient to the law, it could never happen. We couldn't produce any type of righteousness because our righteousness only comes through Jesus Christ. Amen? And so now as we get into the verses uh, 1 through 6 of chapter 4, uh, you know, we'll see it as he continues on here uh, with ministry. It says, therefore, since we have this ministry, as we, as we have received mercy, we do not lose heart. But we have renounced the hidden things of shame, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. But even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing, whose minds the God of this age have blinded, who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. For we do not preach ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your bondservants for Jesus' sake. For it is the God who commanded light to shine out of the darkness, who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's pray one more time. Ask God to bless the, his word. Lord, we come before you and God, we are grateful for your word. God, we're grateful for just the ministry that your word has in our lives. And so, Lord, I pray now that you would just open the scriptures up to us, Lord, and that we would have hearts to receive what your spirit wants to speak into our lives today. And Lord, as I always pray, I pray that you would give us the courage to be doers of your word and not hearers uh, only. So, Lord, we just give you this time now, and it's in Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. You know, as it, as it begun there in the the first verse, it says, therefore, since we have this ministry, you know, a more literal translation would be, therefore, seeing we have this kind of ministry. Uh, you know, it's one of those things where Paul wrote of what kind of ministry, what was he talking about? You know, he described it in the previous chapter, like I said, of the law and of the, of the new covenant that brings life. You know, because it's only through that new covenant, through Jesus Christ, that we can see lives transformed and, and miracles happen in lives, right? We see it all the time in this church, just a transfer, transformation of when people first come in here and, 
And, you know, just watching God work in their lives as they work out that sanctification process. You know, and, and we see it as we take a step back to chapter 3, verses 17 and 18. If I get to the right slide here. It says, now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But we all with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror, the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. You see, uh, I love that first part of it. It says, uh, now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty, right? That transformation process, that moment that we come to know Jesus, we're no longer in bondage as we talked about earlier, but we can have liberty, we can have freedom, we can have the liberty to serve the Lord. We can have the liberty uh, not to go back to our filth and our sin, right? We can have the, the liberty to uh, witness to those who are in darkness still, right? And that's really what we're talking about here. You know, uh, Paul was saying in these verses that he was given a gift, wasn't he? That he was given the gift of a certain kind of ministry that brings life, where he was able to speak life into people. You know, that he could see that transformation. And each and every one of us in this church, that's us too, isn't it? God has given each one of us a ministry. God's given us the ability to serve. In fact, if you are... If you call this your church and you are saved, then you are called to serve within this church. Each and every one of us should be serving in some capacity in this church. Not to serve the church, but we serve God through the church, don't we? And so, you know, as I always say, if we have a pulse, we have a purpose. There should be something that we should be doing in this church. There should be some way that we should be serving. And so as we continue on in this, we read in 1 Timothy chapter 12, chapter 12, chapter 1, verses 12 through 17, it says, And I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, who has enabled me, because he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. Although I was formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor, and an insolent man, but I have obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was exceedingly abundant with faith and love, which are in Christ Jesus. Let's stop here for a second. In that first verse, if you, you know, when Paul's talking about how he was in ministry or the ministry that God had given him, you know, what you realize here is it wasn't about Paul, was it? Paul brought nothing to the table. It was all about what God enabled him to do, as it says here. And it says, uh, our Lord who has enabled me, right? It was only because God had gifted him with certain gifts and abilities, he was enabled to uh, fulfill or serve the ministry in the way that he was. You know, but the Lord has enabled each one of us to serve within the ministry, to serve uh, the Lord with our hearts, right? And so each one of us, God has given us those special giftings for. And then God has placed us in a place where we can use those gifts, right, within the church and all of the outreaches that we do. It's the same thing. God places us in positions in the community with our refuge center, uh, you know, with uh, the events like on July 4th where we can use those gifts. God places us there. You know, once again, it's not about us, is it? It's about what Christ did for us. You know, Paul was so grateful and overwhelmed by, by the grace and mercy of God that he couldn't help himself but serve. You know, that, you know, because he realized, and we should understand too, is when we are saved but we're not serving, we are not getting fed either. We're not, you know, we've been called to serve. You know, I think of it as like a tree without roots. Yes, we're saved and all of that, but we're not getting the, the nutrients that we need because, you know, it's not, we're not sponges. It's not just about taking in, taking in, taking in and never giving back out. No, there's no fruit in that, is there? You know, it's great to be equipped and, and all of that, but we also have to be giving it back out because if we don't spread out, if we don't use our gifts, then we, there's no sustenance there, is there? Because ultimately, it's not just about becoming that tree. No, we need to be rooted and grounded. Why? So that we can bear fruit. 
That's what our faith is about, is bearing fruit, isn't it? You know, and, and that's what God has called us to do. You know, God has called us to service, and we'll see it in 1 Thessalonians let me, 1, 9. It says, For they themselves declare concerning us what manner of entry we had to you, and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God. See, we as Christians, we have that obligation, don't we, um, to fulfill our individual service, our ministries. You know, the moment that we come to the living and true God and we turn away from the idols that we had in our lives, whatever they were, you know, we have the responsibility to serve the living and true God. Are we fulfilling those uh, those obligations, those gifts that they've given us. Paul wrote to the Colossian church in Colossians 4.17, and say this to Archippus, take heed to the ministry which you have received in the Lord that you may fulfill it. You know, Paul commanded those in the Colossians church to make sure that he fulfilled the ministry that he was given. Are we doing that with one another? Are we making sure uh, that, you know, that we're holding each other accountable, that we're fulfilling the ministries that God has given us? Because like I said, each one of us has been gifted from God certain gifts and abilities that we need to be using to minister, shouldn't we? And if we see that, that someone isn't doing that, then we need to make sure that we're holding them accountable. You know, it's one of those things that as we do, too, we're described in, in John chapter 15 as branches. You know, there's some interesting, uh, you know, thoughts about branches. Branches in and of themselves can't have any sustenance, can they? They're not going to bear fruit if they're not attached to the vine. Right? They're going to wither and die. So we need to make sure also that we as Christians, as we're serving, that we are abiding in Christ. In John chapter 15, verses 1 through 8, it says, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. You know, and then as it continues on, it says, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered and they gather them and throw them into the fire and they are burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. By this, my father is glorified that you bear much fruit. So you will be my disciples. See, you know, just a couple of thoughts about these verses. We bear fruit and God is glorified. And ultimately, is that not what our job is, is to glorify God, right? It's not to bring glory to ourselves. It's not to self-promote us. And we'll see Paul actually addresses that in these verses that we're going to talk about. You know, but uh, for context here, or to the focus on a couple of these verses within this section, verse 5 and 6, where it says, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing, right? We know that if we're not abiding in Christ, we can do nothing, right? We also know the opposite is true, that um, we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us, right? When we're abiding in Christ, we can do anything that he's called us to do, but when we're not abiding in him, we can do nothing. You know, the key is abiding in Christ in all of this, isn't it? You know, because it goes on to say that if you're not bearing fruit, you know, you're a branch that's not bearing fruit, you're going to wither and, and uh, dry up, basically, and it's, uh, it gets burned, gets thrown in the fire. You know, we, uh, it's interesting, too, as part of this, as we're bearing fruit, Paul uses the illustration of us as farmers. And what I mean by that in 2 Corinthians 9, 6, it says, But this I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. You know, farmers, 
they know they um, can't stay idle, right? That they have to be putting in the work. They can't look at their field through a glass window on their lazy boy and go, man, I can't wait for the harvest to come in. No, they have to be diligently working the field, don't they? They have to diligently make, uh, make sure, you know, it's whatever they sow, they're going to reap, right? If they just hang out and do nothing to prepare the field and, and do the work they're called to do, they're going to sow or they're going to reap weeds, right? It's only when they, when they pour into the field and, and they sow into it, will they reap the harvest that they want from the field? You know, we're also described as soldiers, aren't we? Uh, you know, in 2 Timothy chapter 2, it says, You therefore must endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No one engaged in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who has enlisted him as a soldier. You know, Soldiers have duties. They have responsibilities, don't they? And if they're not performing their responsibilities, then there's casualties, isn't there? When they're not fulfilling their part of the, of the plan, there's casualties because they're not working cohesively. And it's the same for us. God has put us in uh, you know, this church at this time working together uh, because we are a complete body, aren't we? You know, we are called uh, to serve alongside each other and to complement each other's gifts, right? Um, and as we're also, as Christians, described as workers. You know, in 1 Thessalonians 1.3, it says, Remembering without ceasing, ceasing your work of faith, labor of love, and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of our God and Father. You know, biblical faith is not passive. Biblical faith is not lazy, is it? You know, it, we're called to labor because the, the harvest fields are plentiful, aren't they? You know, if you look at the society that we live in, you look at here in Grants Pass, uh, you know, the, there's many that don't know the Lord, isn't there? You know, and it's a scary thing. You know, when we talk about ministry or, or serving the Lord, it's a life or death thing sometimes. You know, first service, I was telling the story of how Friday um, we were at the, at the thrift store and some of the tents that are on the, the back side of it there um, where the, the homeless population is gathering, we were sitting there and all of a sudden we hear like this bomb go off. And what had happened was a propane tank exploded in somebody's tent and there was a huge fireball you know, and it made me wonder, first and foremost, is, you know, praying that nobody was in that tent. And secondly, if they were, did they know Jesus, right? Because you don't know. We don't know. You know, there's been so many times, um, you know, in ministry where we've given someone counsel or, or uh, shared the gospel with them and they've rejected it and then gone out and, um, you know, ended up dying in their sins. It's just a sad reality, isn't it? But what we've been called to do, it is life or death, you know, spiritually speaking also. And we know from Matthew 9, uh, verses 37 and 38, then he said to his disciples, the harvest truly is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. You know, all of these terms that we are talking about, like I said, you go to Riverside Park, you see the, the, you know, the, the harvest that, that's there, those that need to hear about the Lord, right? But how many of us are willing to get out of our comfort zone and go do it? How many of us are willing to be equipped enough to be able to go do that? How many of us are willing uh, you know, to just perform the task here at the church, right? So that we can share the light of the gospel with the uh, darkened uh, uh, society that out, that's out there. You know, we're expected to be fruitful. We're expected to serve and bear fruit. Colossians 1.10 says that, that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing Him, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. 
you know, this is really what our lives should be about, right? It should be what our ministries are. It should be what this church is about. First and foremost, we should be about fully pleasing Him, right? And all that we say and do, everything that we should do should glorify Him. Secondly, that we should be bearing fruit in every good work that we do, right? And we've seen it in this church. We've seen the, the fruit from all the outreaches and all of the things that we do. But that's only half of it, isn't it? We do, we do the outreach. And it says also increasing in the knowledge of God. Now that we've done the outreach and we've brought a lot of people in, now we have to equip them, don't we? We have to mature them. And that's done with inreach. That's what, you know, all of the Monday night classes, all of the different things that we do, the, the home groups, etc. It's about increasing in the knowledge of God. And then once those that have, been, have come in and are new to the faith, they increase in the knowledge of God, what do they do? They go back out and do the outreach and bring more in, right? And it's a cycle that goes like this. That's discipleship. And so we also read as a, in 1 Corinthians 15, it says, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast and movable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. You know, Paul is telling us that, uh, you know, he was telling the Corinthian church to abound. Or to be plentiful. You know, what is the work of the Lord? What are those things that we've been saved to serve in within the church? What are those things that God has called us to do? You know, and as I was preparing this, I thought of three things really, or, or the Lord gave me three things. And the first one is we should be about acts of love, right? We should be doing those things where we can share the love of Christ with the community, that we should be sharing the love of Christ with one another. Galatians 6 uh, verses 9 through 10 says, And let us not grow weary while doing good, for in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all, especially to those who are of the household of faith. You know, it says, let us not grow weary while doing good, for in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart, right? To me, it's important that we understand if we're serving the Lord, right, if we understand who He is and what He's done for us, how could we possibly grow weary serving the Lord? You know, throughout the years, so many times I've seen people who were serving the, the Lord and they're getting ready for a breakthrough or, you know, that blessing. And, and right before it, you know, they, they grow weary. And it's just one of those things I don't ever understand. You know, we, um, we need to be, as Christians, when we see someone who's in need, especially a Christian, we should be walking alongside them, right? We should be um, helping them. We should be loving on them. You know, it, it's what we are called to do. It begins here in the household of faith, because if we can't love on one another as a big family that we are, big dysfunctional family, but still a family, you know, if those who come in from the outside, those who are looking in on the church to see what it's all about, if they can't see that we love one another, why would they want to stay? Why would they want to see uh, what we are all about. It begins here. And secondly, beyond the acts of love, there also needs to be acts of edification, don't there? We need to be edifying each other. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 through 16 says, And he himself gave some to be apostles, and some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men and the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting, but speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ, from whom the whole body joined and knit together by what every joint supplies according to the effective working by which every part does its share. 
causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. You know, we are to work in edifying the body of Christ, right? That is one of the reasons why we're focusing on the Mondays and the classes. And, you know, we need to make sure that we're building each other up in the knowledge of God, right? That's the second thing we, were, we should be doing. And with the building up, we should be taking that back out and evangelizing. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 24 through 26 says, And a servant of the Lord must not quarrel, but be gentle to all, able to teach, patient, in humility, correcting those who are in opposition, if God perhaps will grant them repentance so that they may know the truth, and that they may come to their senses and escape the snare of the devil, having been taken captive by him to do his will. Right? That's what we're called to do is, uh, as we evangelize, right? If we're truly a servant of God, we're, not to, we're never going to argue somebody into the kingdom of God, right? We're never going to be able to yell at somebody into the kingdom of God. No, but it's only through that gentleness, right? Speaking truth and love. Uh, and more than that, being that living epistle that Paul talked about earlier here in 2 Corinthians, where people can look at our lives and see that something's different, that there's something peculiar about us, right? You know, um, that we are read by all men so that they can see the love of Christ in us. They can see our faithfulness. They can see the good works that we're producing and the fruit that we're producing in our lives. That's what we're called to do. You know, and, and so as we get back to chapter 4, verse 1, you know, we see what this has done, that Paul serving in his ministry has really, it really developed uh, certain characteristics in him that uh, we will do well in, in emulating. The first thing it did is it kept, him from, it kept him from being a quitter, right? Because he knew the power of the gospel. He knew the power of what he was called to do. And he understood uh, you know, how important it was that it was a life and death matter. So back to verse 1, it says, Therefore, since we have this ministry as we have received mercy, we do not lose heart. You know, we knew from earlier that he had confessed to the, to the Corinthians that he struggled, that he had trials. He had such trials that it brought despair, right? You know, he even said, I was in despair. Uh, despair. And in chapter 1, verse 8, he wrote, For we do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, of our trouble which uh, came to us in Asia, that we were burdened beyond measure, above strength, so that we despaired even of our lives. You know, of course, Paul was a man like me and you, right? He was just a human and he was subject to human frailties, just like we are. But he, you know, he also said, how could I lose heart when I'm involved in such a wonderful ministry that God has given me? You know, that God has given me the ability, um, you know, to fulfill this divine calling that people would come to know God through the ministry that was given to me. You know, it's the same for us, isn't it? You know, and not only that, it, uh, he knew the truth. And he also knew that nothing needed to be added to the truth. The truth was sufficient. The truth is absolute and it was, wasn't relative. And he, did, he knew that all he had to do was preach the truth. He didn't need to add his twist to it. He didn't need to add... Um, you know, uh, anything to Scripture, because Scripture in and of itself is enough, isn't it? It's God-breathed. It's His Word. And so we read in verse 2 through 4, But we have renounced the hidden things of shame, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the Word of God deceitfully, but by manifestations of the, of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. But even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing, uh, whose minds the gods of this age have blinded, who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. You know, Paul knew the power of the gospel, and he knew the truth of uh, God's word, didn't he? He didn't need to add to it. He was saying, I'm just going to give it 
absolutely the way it is. You know, and he was obviously at this time rebuking some of the false teachers who had uh, made their way into the Corinthian church and who were um, deceiving some of the people, right? He was saying, no, uh, as a witness of my own conscience, all I did was give you the truth and nothing but the truth because it's only the truth of God's word that's going to save. There's nothing that I can add to it. There's no philosophy or anything else that I can add to it. There is no social justice or anything else that I can add to it. It's only God's word that saves. You know, but there are many out there, as there was in that day, this day, that likes to twist the scripture, don't they? And, you know, if you know the scripture well enough, you can make it say whatever you want. You know, I can make the scripture say, and it does say, there is no God. That simple. But of course, if you read the rest of Psalm 14, you read that the fool has said in his heart, there is no God, right? You know, but um, that's just it. That's part of the reason why we have to give the full counsel of God, right? Because it is God breathed. You know, Paul had nothing to hide, did he? He had nothing. He just gave them the truth. He was just open and honest with them because the thing about it is when you're walking in the truth, then you have nothing to hide. Everything's plain and open. open. You know, he, he wasn't trying to be uh, or add to anything that was there. It was easier for people to believe because he was just giving them the absolute truth of Scripture. You know, because when you start adding to it or telling lies, then you got to remember what you said, right? And then you got to back that lie up with another lie. And then you got to remember the first lie so that you can tell the third lie and, you know, add it on. But... You know, just watch some of the TV preachers. They're pretty good at it. <laughs> I had to think for a minute. Am I on TV anymore? No, that's not. That's not. <laughs> oh, boy is right. <laughs> but even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. Remember, we talked about last week uh, how he was talking about Israel and how they had a veil. Uh, the gospel was veiled from them. They couldn't see it. They were blinded from the gospel, right? You know, it was, they, in context, he was talking about the Judaizers, those who were trying to add a, a yoke of bondage to the new believers in, in the early church, right? And he was saying, why would we do that? Why would we add the yoke of the law onto these new believers. We couldn't keep the law. Our fathers before us couldn't keep the law. So why would we put that on these guys who aren't gonna be able to keep the law too? You know, why not just keep it as Jesus and him crucified? Because that's the only thing it can save anyways. It's not about the law. It's not about traditions of men. It's not about anything. It's just about Christ. So why are we gonna put that yoke of bondage on them? You know, and that's part of the reason why, as we read in Romans eleven twenty five, 25, it says, For I do not desire, brethren, that you should be ignorant of the mystery, lest you should be wise in your own opinion, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles have come in. Right? We know that. The nation of Israel is blind right now. They do not realize, for the most part, that their Messiah has come. Of course, there are a few individuals that have, but as a nation, they haven't. But, you know, that doesn't mean the Gentiles, us, are not blinded either. There's many that are blinded from the truth because of the devil, the God of this world, has deceived them, right? It, it's another reason why we should be sharing the gospel, because there are so many that are deceived. In 1 Corinthians 1.18, it says, for the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. You know, those who are lost, you know, the message of the cross is foolishness to them. They can't understand it. It's just some fairy tale to them, right? But to those who are being saved by it, it's the power of God, isn't it? You know, it's it produces miracles in our lives, doesn't it? We understand it and we need to continue to share it, uh, you know, to those who are perishing because it's, that's the unfortunate reality. And so, so then in the next verses, five and six, Paul gives kind of the, the final characteristics, uh, you know, of, of what the truth of 
of God's word has done for him. And it, he says, you know, um, there are many out there who are self-promoting, but I'm just going to speak the truth. I'm not going to promote myself. I don't need to promote myself because as we said earlier, you know, it's God who does all of the work. It's God who enables us. It's God who puts us in, this, in those places where we can serve. But we read in verses five and six, it says, for we do not preach ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your bondservants for Jesus' sake. For it is the God who commanded light to shine out of the darkness, who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus. He was saying, you know, the God who spoke creation into existence, the God who said, let there be light, and there was light, right? He can do the same thing in our lives. He's saying, I don't need to add to that. I can't add to that anyway. So why would I preach boast of myself? You know, the only thing that I'm going to boast about is Christ Jesus and him crucified, because it's the only thing that matters. It's the only thing that brings glory to God. You know, but there were so many in the church back then and in the church today that want to glorify themselves or bring glory to them when the only one deserving of that glory is God, right? Later on in second, or as we continue on in 2 Corinthians in chapter 10, we'll read these following verses where he talks about this some more. He says, for we, do, we dare not class ourselves or compare ourselves with those who commend themselves, but they measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves are not wise. We, however, will not boast beyond measure, but within the limits of the spear which God appointed us, a spear which especially includes you. You know, he was saying here, um, as he continues on all the way through verse 18, and I'm just going to skip forward because of the time frame, but what it says here is, you know, we're not here to exploit people. We're not here to serve anybody but God, right? We're not here to self-promote. In anything, in any way that God is using us to serve in this church, it all should be done for His glory, not ours. We shouldn't be seeking recognition. We shouldn't be seeking any kind of attaboy or pat on the shoulder because it doesn't matter anyways. If we're doing it with the right heart and we're doing it in truth, we're doing it for God's glory, not our own. You know, it, it, and whatever it is, as we're giving of our time and our talents and our treasures, it's all for His glory. And it shouldn't matter if anybody knows we're doing it or not. You know, if we're doing it for his glory, in fact, we shouldn't want to bring any kind of glory to ourselves because he's the only one that's worth the glory, isn't it? And so, you know, as um, Paul is saying here, you know, and as he was correcting the Corinthians church, he was saying anything other than that, you know, all of these false teachers that have come into the church that are, are, are twisting the truth and who are bringing glory to themselves, you know, um, they can't help you. They can't save a lost sinner. They can't bring someone who was in darkness into light. It's only the gospel of Jesus Christ that can do that. The truth that's found in the scripture and it's powerful and we don't need to add to it. You know, and then in those verses he talked about, uh, you know, referred back to creation, right? Uh, where he says the God who spoke light into existence. You know, and there's a beautiful comparison for us because as in verse 2 of, of Genesis chapter 1, we read about the condition of the earth, right? It says the earth was without form and void and darkness was on the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. You know, isn't that like us before we received Christ as our Lord and Savior? You know, we're without form and void and darkness, Right? We we're walking in darkness, but it was only God, the moment that he made us that new creation in Christ, that all of that changed, wasn't it? As we'll read here in a couple of weeks in 2 Corinthians 5.17, it says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. See, you know, when God begins to form us and fill us with his word, right? And, and we receive the Holy Spirit and we begin, the, we begin to be fruitful for the Lord. You know, like verse um, 
3 of chapter 1, God said, let there be light, and there was light, right? Everything that he's made new in our lives, you know, he drives away the darkness of our sin so that we can walk in that light, right? You know, that's what our relationship with the Lord is, and that's what he's done for us. And so as we get ready now to enter into a time of communion, you know, it's a perfect opportunity for us to examine and think about what God's done for us, right? What he did for us on the cross, you know, who we once were as compared to where we are now. You know, and so as we read in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, um, verses 23 through 26, it says, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. So in verse 26 here, you know, Paul writes how the Lord's Supper is, it was given to us by God himself, right? And uh, it's supposed to bring uni unity within the body of Christ. Isn't that what it's saying here? And also, as we observe the Lord's Supper, we recognize uh, that as we look at the Lord's table, we look at it from three different directions. First and foremost, we see it for the past, the present, and the future. You know, the, in the past, it commemorates what the Lord did for us in that Passover meal talking about here. In Luke 22, verses 14 through 20, we read about it. It says, When the hour had come, he sat down, and the twelve apostles with him. Then he said to them, With fervent desire I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say to you that I will no longer eat of it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you. You know, at that time, Jesus took the bread and the cup of Passover. He passed them around, it, around and it signified that his body would be broken, right? Uh, you know, that it would be torn in the pieces, that it would be sh shed to usher in the new covenant, the covenant of grace, the covenant of mercy. We read back in Jeremiah 31, verses 31 through 33, it says, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant, which they broke, though I was a husband to them, says the Lord. But this is the new covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. You know, and so we see here that the Lord's Supper makes us remember what Jesus did for us on the cross. You know, uh, it says to do this in remembrance of me in both verses 24 and 25 of, you know, of our scriptures here. Paul is stressing that we're always to remember the atoning work that, and sacrifice that Jesus did for us on the cross, right? You know, um, we're also supposed to remember what he's presently doing for us, right? It's communion where we can not only commune with him, but we can commune with one another in unity because the one thing that we have in common is the cross of Christ, regardless. And also, it reminds us of the future commitment that it says, until I return, because he is going to return. And we can glory in that. And we can take, have the hope uh, of knowing that he's going to return one day for his people. Amen? 
And so at this point, you know, I'm going to have Brian play an instrumental and there's going to be pastors and elders up here to pray with you. If you need to do business with God, now's the time while Brian's playing the instrumental. But more than that, communion is for the family of God. If you've never accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, then come let one of the pastors pray with you. Accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, then take communion for the first time, uh, you know, in the family of God. And if there's, you know, if you've kind of backslid and you been in bondage to some kind of sin, let today be the day that you break free from that. Come and let one of the pastors and elders pray with you so that you can take uh, communion with a, with a clean heart. So with that being said, I'm going to have Brian uh, play, while, pray, play while people are being prayed for. And once he's done, we'll take communion together. Brian? You know, as we were saying, the Lord's Supper keeps us focused on the cross, doesn't it? Or at least it should. It draws us in the fellowship with God in the body of Christ. It gives us that hope of the resurrection, you know, the, the promise of victory over Satan and sin and, and the truth of heaven. So as we get ready to partake together as, as a family, you know, just once again to read from Luke chapter 22. And in verse 19, he says, And he took bread and gave thanks and broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And so, Lord, we do come before you. God, we do remember your sacrifice on the cross for us. Lord, may we never forget uh, your, your atoning work that you did for us, Lord. And so, God, we just love you and praise you. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Take the bread. And Scripture continues in verse 20 of Luke 22. It says, Likewise, he also took the cup after supper, supper saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you. Lord, we're so grateful that you did 
shed your blood for us, Lord, that you wrote the new covenant, the covenant of grace and mercy that we can obtain uh, was written in your blood. And so, Lord, we also know that without the shedding of blood, there's no remission from sins. And we're grateful that you've washed us clean, Lord. And so, God, now as we get ready to take this juice that represents your blood, God, I pray that you would help us to remember uh, all that it represents and the sacrifice that you made for us on the cross. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And with that being said, you know, God bless you all. Um, this coming up week, the, we'll be in Genesis 14 on Wednesday, and then we'll be back in uh, chapter 4 next Sunday. And with that, let's close and ask God just to bless the remainder of our day in this upcoming week. So, Lord, we come before you once again, and we're so grateful for your word. We're so grateful for your sacrifice on the cross. And God, I'm so grateful that you allow us to serve you through the ministries that you've given each and every one here. And so, Lord, I pray that you would help us to walk in the middle and in the midst of our callings, Lord, that we would walk worthy of it. And so, Lord, we just love you and praise you. Lord, I ask that you would just bless the remainder of this day. God, get every, give everyone traveling mercies on their way home. And it's in Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Well, hopefully we see you all on the 4th of July outreach. And in the meantime, God bless you. Have a wonderful rest of your afternoon.